I hate SD card speed ratings. I think everyone does by now. They litter the face of the cards with a bunch of old icons that seem to be useless. Yep, some of these ratings shouldn't even be there anymore, but SD car manufacturers like to practice the old Microsoft marketing tactics and add as much text as possible to make you think you're getting a great deal. They think their poor design choices to confuse the customer is actually reducing buyer's remorse, but it's not, it's confusing. And there are actually some good reasons why, just a few. Here is a fairly standard SD card from SanDisk. Let's get rid of the sample text first. We know SanDisk is the brand. An Extreme Pro is a kind of model version. And the lock icon is there to let you know you can lock the card if you want, so it doesn't get overwritten by interns when you ask them to download your work. And that's just a design quirk for separation. The most familiar item next is memory. The 128 GB stands for 128 gigabytes and is how much memory the card can hold. But this is where some of the trickery begins. And this is because the amount of memory is directly related to the SD card type. Yes, there are different types of SD cards, which is a compatibility issue for devices. SD or Secure Digital by itself was the original, then HC, XC, and UC, which is high capacity, extended capacity, and ultra capacity. Okay, let's suppose I have four different cameras that accept SD cards of each type of SD card available. Now let's see what devices the first SD card is compatible with. It's compatible with all devices, since those standards and cameras were made afterwards. The big warning here is that even if the card works and the other cameras, all of the other functionality will not be available, like the Sony RX105 for example. Let's put in a super old SD 2GB card. It will let me take pictures, but it will not let me take high frame rate video. That requires a faster card. One more example and we'll move on. Now let's say we have an SDXC card, extended capacity. Where can that type of card be used? It can only be used with SDXC devices and above, like SDUC. So the key here is that the larger type cards are not backwards compatible because the newer types don't work with older devices. But the smaller cards are compatible with the later devices, but may not be usable based on the speed the device's requirements to operate, or take video in our case. Okay, onto the bus interface, which is the super small character, a Roman numeral 1, that is usually located behind the SD card type, SDXC in this case. It defines the first limitation for speed, which is how fast can any data travel in or out of the card. So if you know the bus speeds, you'll start with a better understanding of the speed ratings, which is where most of the confusion is. We're almost there. The speed ratings will, or should, operate within the bus speed to read or write the data to the memory inside of the SD card. Here are the primary bus interfaces today, starting with the oldest on top, default speed. Here's the symbology you can find on the card, or not find in the case of default speed and high speed. And here are the maximum bus speeds. I'm not gonna break them down beyond the max speeds of the bus. There are a lot of charts that show the differences between UHS-1 cards like SDR50 or SDR104, but you can look those up on your own if you're curious. A quick note about physical differences between the bus interfaces. If you look on the back of your SD card, you'll see that UHS-1 and prior has only one row of pins, while UHS-2 cards have an additional row. You can see that we have a UHS-1 bus with a maximum of 104 megabytes per second. But wait a minute, there's already an issue. This card magically thinks it can go faster than the bus. How is this possible? Did they mess up? I chose this card on purpose to begin to identify some issues. In this case, SanDisk decided to create a card that can go faster, but only if you have their special card reader, which uses special software to access those read speeds. So for an extra $80 or so, you can gain the advantage with these type of SanDisk cards, which may be an advantage to you since those cards are fairly cheap but those speeds will probably never be available for any other device besides their special reader since cameras and other devices are already moving on to UHS-2 and 3, which are much faster than UHS-1. Finally, we get to look at the speed ratings. I'm gonna leave the 200 megabytes per second with that suspicious asterisk for now. If you see a C with a number in it, it's the C class because the letter C surrounds the number, while C10 is 10 megabytes per second. That makes sense. If you see a U with a number in it, it's the UHS speed class. It was created with the UHS bus, which is why it inherited the name. U1 equals 10 megabytes per second, while the only other option is three, is 30 megabytes per second. Can you see another issue already? 
Y have C10 that stands for 10 megabytes per second, and a U1 that also stands for 10 megabytes per second. We'll keep going. On to the third speed class. If you see a V with numbers beside it, this is the video speed class, starting at V6, which is 6 megabytes per second, then V30, V60, and V90, which is 90 megabytes per second. So looking at this card, we have a C10, U3, and V30. Through all of the research I read through, it seemed like the SD card manufacturers kept the older C10 standard because camera manufacturers still use it in their manuals and sometimes help their cards remain backwards compatible with C10 devices. Even though the real number we should pay attention to is the V30 and ignore the rest. 30 megabytes a second is your maximum continuous write speed that this card can perform in your camera, even though they have 200 megabytes per second with an asterisk stamped next to the speed rating. Let's put all these speeds on a graph to more easily see what's happening here. We know that the bus is a UHS-1 bus, so it's 104 megabytes per second. So the fastest anything should be able to travel is 104 megabytes per second. It is a V30 card, so we know that the max continuous write speed is 30 megabytes per second. The next one is where it gets tricky. There is a theoretical maximum read speed of 104, just like we said, if you plugged it into your computer today. But if you buy SanDisk's special SD card reader engineered for these cards, the max read speeds can push beyond the bus to their advertised 200 megabytes per second using their proprietary software and special memory chips. That's what this little tiny asterisk is trying to tell you. I'm glad it was so obvious to everyone. Thanks, SanDisk. Now let's look at a card that doesn't deviate from the bus, but it does have another surprise for us. Let's start with the V60 speed, as that is the most important number for continuous write speeds for our camera. And place it on the chart next to the max bus speed, as discussed earlier. Now we'll add the maximum read speed of 250 megabytes per second, or how fast your computer can download the file. But then we run into a new number we haven't talked about yet, 1667X. This is probably the most useless number of all since it is just repeating another number already displayed on the card. This number comes from a standard based on the original transfer speed of CD-ROMs, which was 150 kilobytes per second. So here's the math. Take the X number of 1667 and multiply it by 150 kilobytes and you get 250 million bytes, which is 250 megabytes per second. That is dumb and unnecessarily repetitive. This is definitely one number that needs to go away forever and not come back. For the next example, let's look at a ProGrade SD card with another new surprise. ProGrade SD cards have a much cleaner appearance than many other SD cards, so I can appreciate that. But they have an added R on the bottom of some cards. What this means is that the card is compatible with their Refresh Pro software, which requires a subscription for about $10 a year. It allows you to refresh the SD card to factory condition every now and again. This is a handy option because memory in SD cards is great after use but I hate the idea that they charge a subscription for the software that isn't just included with the card. Here are four more random cards to look at. You'll notice some of the cards text say HD video, 4K, and 8K stamped on the front. I understand that there's some relevancy stated in the SD card standards about picture sizes and how they rank their cards, but I don't really care. And it has to do with my answer to the next unnecessary text, which is how long can an SD card record for? You'll see this card says it can record for 116 hours of HD video. The problem with that number is that they don't know what kind of compression I'm using. If my camera is compressing with H.265, it'll compress in half the size than equivalent H.264 file. So again, I don't care about this number and want it removed from SD cards. Most cards have this little switch so you can lock the card from being overwritten, as we mentioned earlier. But a unique purposeful feature of the Sony card was to remove it. It's a tough card edition, so maybe they thought that it would make the card weaker. Don't know, but it's an interesting feature to look for. Speaking of the Sony card, there is a red G stamped on the front. I looked on Sony's website and could not see any purpose for this mark, other than it being related to a series or a model of a card. I personally would love to see all model information move to a separate area so we're not more easily confused. ProGrade at least had a purpose for their symbology with the ratings area, so I appreciate that. I'd love to see Sony move the text like this in an area closer to the company name. 
Next up is an icon you'll usually see on micro SD cards, but some SD cards have this as well. If you see an A with a number behind it, it's the Application Performance class. This is important for SD or micro SD cards being used in products like cell phones that will run apps off the card while simultaneously saving and accessing photos. This isn't something that is important for cameras today since they are usually just writing one file at a time. A1 and A2 have the same minimum sustained sequential write speeds of 10 megabytes per second but the A2 card can read and write more items than the A1 at the same time. This just means the A2 card has the ability to multitask better. Now let's look at five cameras and see if we can't figure out what card is best to use with it and why. Let's start with the S5. Panasonic is great and shows you the exact bitrate for each video setting. In their lowest video setting, you see 20 MBPS. We run into our first problem. What in the world is MBPS? This stands for megabits per second, not megabytes per second like we've been talking about this whole time for SD cards so far. All you have to do though when you see MBPS is divide that number by eight since there are eight bits in a byte. So 200 megabits per second is 25 megabytes per second. Now we have the real value to understand what kind of SD card to use. In this case, it's the V30 SD card. Another method, usually the easiest one, is to look at the manual. On page 25 of the Lumix S5, it says to use the V30 card. Now the Canon M50 and EOS R are similar that the menus sadly don't show their speed ratings. So in the Canon EOS R manual on page 611, it says you need a video speed class 60 card if you want to film in 4K all eye. And as we discussed already, that is the V60. The V stands for video. In the Canon EOS M50 help guide on page 89, we see the highest 4K setting is 15,000 kilobytes per second, which is the same as saying 15 megabytes per second. So a U3 or V30 card would work great. In the Sony RX100 Mark V, we get some numbers similar to the S5, but we don't know what 100M means. Is it megabits or is it megabytes? Going to the manual, we get the answer, megabits, which means we have to convert this to megabytes. 100 megabits is 12 and a half megabytes. And finally, the Blackmagic 6K Pro. Sadly, we are missing the numbers here, just like the Canon, so let's see what the manual says. The manual for SD cards recommends the fastest SDV90 cards on the market today. But engineers at Blackmagic knew the challenge of this particular camera since bit rates are so massive. So they provided three methods to save video files that have cheaper alternatives. The SSD is the cheapest option in this case. I never use SD cards in the 6K Pro. Let's end with a few questions. Do you always need the fastest card for your camera to cover every single maximum setting? No, if you're not using it. For example, I'm never filming Q0 6K in the Blackmagic 6K Pro. Do you want faster read times to improve your workflow? For me, yes. If you can get faster read times to speed up how quickly your computer downloads your files, then it speeds everything up and is worth every penny. The speed classes have definitely become muddled over the years, but I'm a broken optimist and think we will continue to move towards a more no-nonsense approach. Similar to CFast cards, where we only see read and write speeds instead of worrying about layers of junk icons from a forgotten era. And similarly, I'm hoping that camera manufacturers will add megabytes per second in the video settings so we can more quickly understand what we need to successfully operate this camera. It kind of makes sense why many of the manufacturers are still trying to add these icons. They're trying to maintain backwards compatibility and forward mobility with the new standards. I don't understand why some of the standards are still there, but here's hoping they begin decluttering the process to cut the fat and get us to what we need to know faster. Manufacturers will continue to come out with their own proprietary deviations from the SD card standard, sadly, and it's gonna keep trying to mess us up. But I hope that this video helped prepare you to be ready to more easily identify those deviations or special symbols that seem out of place. Thanks so much for making it to the end of such a convoluted topic to explain. This was a lot of fun to discover, so many weird insights about SD cards, and I hope it was enjoyable for you to learn as well. Please leave any questions or comments below, and I'll see you in the next video.